Well, hello, hello. What's happening? <laughs> I hope you had a great day. So let me click around here a little bit. Just one moment. Um, I need that one. Okay. So glad you found your way to the sketch session tonight. So glad you decided to pull out your pencils and, and draw. And uh, I hope you're ready for a really good workout because that's what I have prepared for you. The lesson we have on tap is how do we draw stuff that you don't know the first thing about? And we're going to use waves as an example because I don't draw waves very often, very rarely do I draw them. And so um, I want to demonstrate how I work my way through something that I don't know anything about. And um, we'll struggle together if that's what we're going to do. Um, if you're finding this recording or you're here live with us for the very first time, welcome. My name is Carolyn Peters and I'm the owner of Curious Studios and that's where I teach classical drawing skills so artists can build a very solid foundation to explore their creative voice from. And every Thursday we hang out for an hour and we practice together. And these practice sessions, let me give you the lay of the land, how you can get the most out of them. Because they're not just me producing a beautiful drawing for one hour and you watch, it's actually quite different. So every sketch session has a topic and we focus on a subject matter that rotates from figure, portrait, animals to inanimate things. And you want to see them as a, a, a workout, a place where you um, get sweaty, where you try out new things, where you dare to fail. Nobody else is going to see it. Um, only you're going to see my failures or successes, whichever it will be in the evening. But it's about the practice, the doing, rather than the focusing on a perfect product. Most likely we won't be getting to a finished product or nowhere near, but that's not the point. The point is to run through the drawing process by making quick decisions because as you make these quick decisions um, you get better and better and more sure-footed in your future drawings. So I see this as a gym where we work out our drawing skills mixed together with a playground where we experiment, where we have fun, where we don't take ourselves too seriously. And like that, you can get the most out of it by drawing alongside with me, by having the reference images on a big screen so you can see very easily what it is we're drawing from. And like that, you will truly grow rather than just consume the content that I'm um, providing for you. So I'm seeing the crew is ready to draw Bill, Chris, um, Ted, Jacob, uh, let me just see, hold on a second. Um, oh, you can draw in whatever medium you want. This is your workout session, so you make it work for you. Alrighty, well, let's dive right in. As I said, I have quite a bit prepared for us tonight and um, might as well get started. Um, when we, and by the way, <laughs> this, this session is Chris's fault. <laughs> It was him who decided that we need to draw waves and um, that's what we're doing tonight. So everybody say thanks, Chris. But anyways, so let's dive in. When we draw something that we know very little about, what we want to begin with, the point number one that we want to think about is that we want to strip away any of the narrative that makes it special in our head. So for waves, you know, you might be telling yourself something like, oh, it's out of water and water is liquid and it's see-through and reflective. And, you know, all of a sudden your brain starts to freeze up because of all the stuff that you're, um, that's attached to the thing. And instead, after you stripped away that narrative, you want to think back to, no, it's not special. It's just another thing and things get drawn in the same manner. And that is the second point of the evening. You begin with a gesture. You lead that gesture to a shape. Once you have a good shape, you then transform that shape into a form. And once you have those three things, gesture, shape, form, you can then add um, value. And if you have time, you can also add some texture later on. Usually we want to jump into the texture first, right? The ripples, the reflections, etc. cetera. But uh, we're going to follow our process because we know if we have a solid process, we don't get confused, we don't get overwhelmed, we don't run off the page. So once you have that in mind, the third point that I have for you tonight is this. Especially if you've never drawn some, uh, if, you, if you've never drawn that subject matter before, you want to spend some time beforehand and really think about 
what else is this thing like? The good news is that everything in life has something that's similar to it. So you might be freaked out by the idea of water, but if you think about the idea of sand dunes, you might be thinking, oh, I know how to draw sand dunes. Those are easy. So for me, if I think of waves, they're very similar to sand dunes. If you think about like a beautiful Sahara Desert sand dune, they're just like pyramidal forms. There's a crest running on the top. One side will be light, the other side will be shadow. It's easy peasy. Of course, yes, there will be some texture on top of it because it is a glassy sand dune in our case. But once you have this kind of similar thing to compare it to, it doesn't seem quite as daunting. Point number four, once you found that kind of metaphor, it's a good idea to study a little bit about the anatomy. Just like when you study figure drawing, it's useful to know, let's say you wanna draw an arm, it's useful to know, okay, there's a deltoid, there's a bicep, a brachialis, a tricep, there's gonna be the epicondyles, there's gonna be the elbow bump. And it's not that knowing the words is going to make your drawing better, but it is by understanding the parts that make up the whole that will help you make sure that everything is accounted for in your drawing. So if in your drawing you don't have a line that represents the deltoid's edge, then you know something is missing. If you don't have a line or a shading um, element that um, points to the, the elbow bump, then you know that something is missing in your drawing. And Likewise, the same is true for waves. So later on, when I switch the cameras to the overhead camera, I'll show you a little bit about the anatomy of a wave. And Chris can correct me as we go along if I say anything the wrong way. And again, it's not about the words. It's just about knowing, okay, now I can check my drawing. Am I representing this part? Do I have a representation for that part? And so forth. Once you've done that, once you're kind of, you have a metaphor for the thing, you've um, understood the parts, the anatomy, then you can eventually start dealing with the more special parts of, of, the, of the subject matter. And so for us, this might be that some waves might look see-through. So how do you deal with something that's see-through? Well, think about what else is see-through. Glass is see-through. And when we draw glass, we're not really all of a sudden have a special, we don't all of a sudden have a special color. Like it's not like the glass has a color. No, the values that we see is basically what's behind the glass because the glass is see-through. So with the waves, the values that we'll be seeing in our drawing will be the values of whatever is behind it. So it's most likely gonna be the sky. Yes, it'll be slightly darker because the water makes it darker than the sky itself, but you wanna have these lighter see-through shapes next to the darker shapes that are um, in areas where the water is more dense. And then the last step I alluded to it earlier is um, you add the texture in areas where you want to draw attention to. So that might be um, at the crest where it's breaking, you wanna pay attention to those smaller shapes or in the billowing clouds of the whitewash. Or if there's a very choppy surface, you wanna um, focus on some of the ripples up front. But again, that comes at the very end. So let me see, I see somebody else in the, in the chat. <laughs> Well, I'm not sure who you are at Clay Design, but I'm so glad if you must have been a student of mine. So I'm happy that we can hang out and have another um, class like that. Alrighty, so let me switch the camera and I'm going to show you the wave anatomy. Let's see. I need to push this button. Last time I forgot. Okay, there we go. Okay, so you remember how I said you want to begin with a gesture then find the shapes and then define that into form. Here are the most simplified versions of waves. This is kind of a wave that's building up. Here it's starting to curl over, here it's breaking. Notice if you are after a very dynamic um, drawing, you definitely wanna pick the one that's breaking. Um, this here is less dynamic. So how do you make this here? This is two dimensional. These are just lines creating little shapes. How do you get that to become three-dimensional? You look for plane changes. So you see this red line here? You see this red line here? Those are plane changes. It's the edge where this plane stops and the front face 
begins. So as I said earlier, waves are kind of like sand dunes and there will be these very clear plane changes. Another thing that's useful to think um, about when you draw waves is that they have facets. Um, only very rarely do we have these beautiful glassy waves where it's just no ripples, right? Often there's wind, it gives the waves a little bit of a choppy texture, and so you'll have more facets to it. So think about finding these kind of edges within the face or within the back here. Okay, another thing that I want to um, point out before we get into the waves is here. If you have, if you see the wave from the side and you want to indicate that there's a spatial layering happening, you want to emphasize overlaps. So you see how here we have this um, curl of the wave and I know this is super simplified, very graphic, not really what waves look like in real life, but it's this T intersection that creates some spatial dimension or this T intersection that creates spatial dimension. So look for overlaps. All right, last thing, here comes the wave anatomy. So here we have our wave, see how it's breaking, curling over, and here is the body of the water. So we have, as the wave is breaking, the thing that everybody knows about is the spray or the white water, the billowing clouds, right? Then right above that, where the water is not white yet, that's called the lip, where it's breaking. And if you follow that lip over to the big part of the wave, that's called the crest. So we, again, it's not so much about the right words right now, it's more about um, accounting for those elements. You'll have to account for the lip portion and you'll have to notice that that's slightly different from the crest portion. Under the lip, we have the barrel of the wave. And there is um, up front the wall of the wave and the shoulder. Um, but within the barrel in particular, as you get towards the wall, there, that's where you'll find these facets that I was talking about. So just kind of keep an eye open later on for these kind of darker shapes that imply that there is a um, planar shift happening. And that's pretty much it. I already mentioned the white water, the spray. So there's not much more that I wanted to point out in regard to this. Um, if you're interested, this is just some um, something that I came across as I was studying wave anatomy. This is how they, they build. They come rolling in from the back. They build, they break. And as they flow towards the shore, there might be a secondary break or just some more white water ripples. And then you have the, the, the foamy whitewash on the sand too. All right, so we have four images that we'll be working from and I time every image for 15 minutes tonight and we'll just see how far we get. And I'm dreading this because I don't draw waves very often and that's okay because these, again, these are practice sessions so we can get better. These are not performance sessions. That's what I'm telling myself. So here we go, I'm gonna hit the timer button and let me find my place on the page. Alrighty. So the first part is we want to find the gesture of this wave. How is this wave coming down and breaking? What type of curve is this? And where is it splashing into that white water? Lip turning into the crest. I don't want to get too big here. And then we have the barrel. And right now I'm drawing very lightly. I'm just kind of trying to um, sense where do I need, where do I see some bigger facets? And then here, that's already kind of the end of the wave. That's kind of just the, the surface of the water in front of the wave. See how it's building up here. Okay, so I thought my way through the gesture. Here I see the back of the ocean. All right, so next I'm going to work on making these shapes more particular. So right now I just have this very loose gesture. So I'm gonna work on If 
finding the big shapes. So this is um, something you'll hear me say all the time. When we look at shapes, we want to begin with the biggest shapes first. So rather than um, doing what's super tempting, which is jumping into these smaller ripples up front and the surfers, like all the kind of more interesting stuff, um, we have to be disciplined and do the non-glamorous stuff of looking at angles and, and wondering, ooh, what type of angle is it? So definitely not sexy whatsoever, but it makes for a much better drawing if you do run through that process. So all this spray that's kind of rushing across the, the edge here, I'm going to ignore that for now. I know it's interesting, I know that's dramatic, but that's not gonna make my drawing clear at this point. And to get a good big shape, you want to switch from drawing with curvy lines to drawing angular lines just because um, we can be more specific with those. Okay, got that. So I have my big entities, that curl coming down, that cloud. The next thing I'll be working on is placing those smaller facets. So you see inside that barrel there, there's some darker shapes. I'm gonna lightly just put little placeholders for them there. And what I recommend is that you squint when you do this. And you're not going for all the little feathery elements of these facets yet. You just kind of, when you squint, how narrow is it? How broad is it? All right, so now I'm gonna, I'm coming out of this barrel and towards the more mellow part of the wave that's still building here on the right hand side. And you can probably tell how the top um, is darker or more greenish. And then right in here, it's lighter, or maybe let's say more purplish, bluish. Uh, and right around here is a plane change happening. So we have, if you think in terms of cross contours, a plane that's oriented like this, and then right here, it dips to be more like that. So I don't have to leave these lines here to say that, but um, later on when I put some value on it, um, I'll, I'll stop my darker value right here on that edge. Okay, so now, um, I have what I said I would do. I had my gesture, I have my shapes. Uh, I thought about my forms or plane changes, turn shapes into form. Here's another plane change. So I paid my due diligence, so now I can get into some value work. So if you squint, you'll see how all the blue part is much darker than the white part. It's called the local value. And as I'm putting down this local value, I'm not going full throttle with my 
marks. Because I don't know yet how dark it needs to be. And of course, time is ticking. 15 minutes isn't a lot. We have about almost eight minutes left. You have to make a decision what you're willing to let go of and what do you want to um, kind of zero in on. So let me do a little bit more work on the clouds here, the billows. So rather than thinking about the, the big white wash there as one big single thing, they're actually a couple of individual items. And those items are basically like, like clouds or like cotton candy puffs. So you want to identify how many are there. So I have one big one up front, then there's a smaller one behind that, then there's a very light one behind that. And then there's a very fuzzy torn up one in the back. So how do you make that fuzzy torn up one look fuzzy? Now that's part of the texture stage. So I'm not allowing myself to do that quite yet, but if I were to do that, you basically need to pull open those edges. You see how the very closed up edges right now that makes things look solid. If you ruffle those edges up, it'll look more textured. So also, because, you know, as I said, 15 minutes, we won't be able to finish this. Of course, you can always come back, hit the pause button and um, keep drawing for however long you want. Um, but if you want to see how I would resolve one of these waves, you can let me know in the chat at the end. Um, again, we'll have four. You can just say, oh, I would love way. I would love to see how you resolved wave number two. You know, just you can even just say number two in the chat and just leave it at that. So right now I'm looking at some of the shadows in the clouds. I call them clouds, they're not really clouds, but you know what I mean. And if you compare, like if you squint your eyes and you compare how light the shadows on the whitewash are compared to any values in the blue parts of the water, those should be much lighter than the water. Then underneath the whitewash, you wanna put a nice accent there because, you know, water isn't different from anything else. It still will cast a shadow. It will still trap um, light from getting into hard to reach places, so. That's why having classical drawing skills is so useful because it doesn't matter what it is you're drawing. If you understand the principles that are at work in a good drawing, you can draw anything. You might do so clunkily and uh, awkwardly the first few times around until you've kind of felt it out. But it's not like you're um, stabbing in the dark. Is that what is that the saying? Stabbing into the dark. And then here we have the ocean behind. So getting that contrast right is going to be the important part. And 
And I'm kind of pulling this edge open a little bit. Okay, so let's go back over here. See if I have some time for the, the barrel. So even this part where the, what, what was that called? The break, the lip, I think it was called the lip. Where the lip is, there's some shadow on those clouds too. So that's, they should have their own shape here. You see now that darkness that I had for the blue part is much too light. So any um, little segment of this lip here curling over is just an individual smaller cloud. And so again, you first wanna find the shape of that cloud and then see if you can turn that shape into a form. And so I've been using these little cast shadow, excuse me, form shadow indications Okay, so now I'm gonna start working finally into the blue part and start pulling out some of these facets. And if this was a long drawing, I'd be very careful in, in plotting out where they are exactly, how closely they're spaced together, how big they are compared to each other. Since I only have a few minutes, I'm not being quite as careful as I otherwise would be. So we have this long one here. So I had my um, underdrawing indication earlier, so that's useful to have. And you see how those kind of darker facets, they are kind of torn up too, like they're not perfect. Okay, here goes the first timer. But I begin with a simple shape and then later on I would um, segment them into the smaller shapes that you see. All right, drawing number one is done. Let's get to the next one. Let's set the timer again. Here we go. Okay, so where's my hand? Right here, so again, Let's find the gesture first. It's actually curling down like this. So you see how this is so simple, but it's really important. So at first my initial gesture was, ah, oh, it's kind of like that. But then I asked myself, no, what does that curve really look like? It's actually higher on the left and then lower on the right. So it's a small difference, but it's an important difference. So that's our gesture and we have this tighter pocket in here going down we have some waves behind it and then here is that face coming at us so very very zoomed in so we have all this kind of um, surface in front now that I have the gesture, I'm gonna deal with the more particular shape, thinking, okay, here's the crest, 
and then it forms into a lip. This one is kind of splashing back. And I keep it simple. I don't deal with the little spray sprays yet. So if you have like all these water droplets creating a, this wild spray, stop thinking individual water droplets and start thinking if I had to group them into a big shape and I would use straight angles for that big shape, what would that look like? That's what you're after. Here we have an overlap. So this facet pulls into the body of the wave and this is behind. Okay, and then we have, I don't know if you remember the, or if you were here for the fabric lesson, it's a little bit similar because in the fabric lesson, we were always thinking about the pull. Where is the point of tension coming from? And this is very similar. So you have these points of tension from the physics. Not like I understand much of that physics, but um, you can you can definitely tell what the origin point is or where it's kind of being pulled toward. Okay, so this shape here up front is that darker um, shape that you see. It's like a plane that's kind of angling at us, not catching any of the light, and so. If you want to be technical about it, this line right here, the top line of the dark edge, the dark shape, excuse me, that's a plane change. So we're going from a plane that's facing away to a plane that's facing up. That is how you create form. Plane changes. If you've never heard of them before, start to notice when people talk about plane changes. It's another way of saying the surface orientation. So we have here kind of like a triangular facet. It's very chopped up, but this is angled this way. So again, I'm thinking about that sand dune idea. And if I had to draw it as a sand dune, where would I put my plane changes? Um, and is it clear cut? No, because there's so many smaller ripples. But you just do your best deciding, ah, I think I'm gonna make that plane change here. Right now I'm seeking, so I, I had this line right here. I'm looking, where does that belong to? So here's a triangular shape I had. It belongs to this here. Let me redraw that. So we always think that in drawing, the mark making is what counts. That's just not true. The thing that matters is that you make your marks and then you assess. And I've talked about this a lot, but I'll do it again. The assessment part is the hardest part because that's when you have to 
look your mistakes straight in the eye. And nobody wants to do that. It's just not fun. It feels much better to keep drawing, 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 drawing. Okay, so I think I got my structure planned out enough. Here, let's be a bit more explicit about this plane change here. So you see this line right here at the bottom, that's where you go from that wall into that little peak that comes and starts to crest there. Okay, so now I'm, I think I'm, I'm ready to start applying some shading. And again, not shading in the sense of making this beautifully refined. I don't have enough time for that. But shading to in imply um, facet that's angling away from the light, facet that's angling at the light. So everything is being built in stages. And then here, because it's curling, let me make this a little bit different. That's going to cast a shadow now, even if it's see through. It might not be a super dark shadow, but it'll cast a shadow right here. So the cleaner you get these facets, once you've done it for the whole wave, if you've done it well, it'll read. If it doesn't read, it means either your shapes are too blobby, meaning not angular structured enough, or they're not aligned well with each other, or they're just too sh um, shredded open. That, that might be another reason. So here is a long, thin one coming in on the side. And that's actually split in two. So later on I can erase back into that. And then here I have that bigger one. So if you're just coming in at this part of the live stream and you see this, you'd be wondering like, what is she drawing? Like, why does this look like a puzzle? Um, I don't get it. it. Doesn't look like a wave to me. She doesn't know what she's talking about. <laughs> um, so I, I am very aware that this does not look like a wave at this point. That's because I'm not finished. And so if you ever, and the reason I'm bringing it up is because we, I'm, I remember and I still have it, that pull inside of us as artists of like wanting to rush it to a place, wanting to rush your drawing to a place where it reads so you can so, so you can prove that you're an artist. You, you know what I mean? It's like the, oh, this looks like crap. Um, 
I feel bad about it looking weird. Um, let me hustle really quickly to get it to a place where it looks like what I think it's supposed to look like. So when we draw from, from that mode of operating, then we're always in the defensive and we forget our process. And if you're a bit more seasoned, you know that the process has many ugly phases and that if you keep going with the process, you'll end up in a place where it's resolved. Okay. So here I have that foreground, very big abstract light and dark shapes. I'm just kind of grouping those darker shapes together right now. This is that dark, dark. Jag it kind of follows all the way through here. Okay, so now I'm thinking um, what planes get the most light. So it seems like right here is the brightest spot. This is still pretty bright, but not quite as bright. And then it gets gradually darker and darker. So I can think about that as I start adding some local value. And again, very few things in your drawing will be white if, if you're doing a tonal drawing. Um, only the light on the whitewash will be close to the whiteness of the page. So of course, if you're drawing in a linear manner, like if you're not using shading, then that might be different for you. So I'm gonna probably get this pretty smudged up. So I'm gonna work a little bit in here, see if I can pull out some of the smaller detailed shapes. So again, when we only have 15 minutes, we have to count our losses and decide what do we wanna focus on? What are we willing to let go of? And with what kind of a short handification can we live? If you want it to look just exactly like the thing you see, then what that requires is more time commitment. More time commitment and very careful um, plotting out of how all the details align with each other. So just know that if, if, if you resonate with hyper-realism, if that's your goal, um, it, the cost for it is time, time and patience. And if you're, uh, you know, if that's not your strong suit, then just know that you're setting yourself up for a struggle. Doesn't mean you shouldn't be aiming for it, just means like you shouldn't expect it to be easy. It might be just the thing you need though. Oh man, 15 minutes goes so fast. So again, um, none of this is resolved. None of this is finished. Uh, I have two more images for us to work from. Um, at the end, you can let me know which one of these you wanna see resolved. Okay, so this one is a really good image for all the facets. And here you can also see um, some textural differences. So um, I don't know if you can see where my mouse is. Yeah, I think you should be able to see it. So you see how here we have the bluish parts, here's the more see-through parts, but then here in the dark black part um, below the wave, you see all the kind of white, um, it's kind of like a netting. Um, so that's kind of foam that's all stretched thin. That's texture. You want to ignore that kind of stuff in the beginning. 
So um, think of it, if this was made out of sand instead of water, how would you go about drawing that? So first, of course, let's begin with a gesture. So gesture, what does gesture mean? It means the angle. What's the angle? What's the placement? What's the overall rhythm? And as I'm making these marks here, I'm actually counting already. I'm, I'm saying, okay, if this is the end, then I see one facet here. I see a bigger one here, it's number three. And I see another big one here, number four. And that's gonna split like a Y almost. And then I get the, the crest breaking into the white water. And those are clouds. And those clouds, rather than thinking about the individual little droplets, what's the overall rhythm of this thing? The overall shape of that white water cloud. Okay, so now I have my gesture. Let's make this into a better shape. When I erase, by the way, I usually erase out underdrawing stuff that is now in the way. I don't erase so much because, oh, this is wrong, you know, let me redo this. Um, I mean, of course, if I notice a, a mistake and it's clear to me that's a mistake, um, then I'll erase it. But I think often we get caught up in perfectionism and we just spend so much time erasing, erasing, erasing that we never get anywhere with our drawing. So in, in, if, if that's you, it's better to just lay down what you got, take it as far as you can, do so confidently, do so by using your, your drawing tools, like your measuring tools, your comparisons, and know that the more you draw like this, the better your, your lines will become that you put down. If you constantly spend your time erasing, 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 you never get to make those decisions. You never get to put those lines down. Okay, so see I've built out the edge here, kind of looking at the different angles. Got a little bit too carried away with the details and lost my big picture here. So here's a longer stretch and then this is a short up and over. Okay, a little better. Okay, let me keep working on the form now. So after shape comes form. Thinking about where does the surface orientation change? And especially with these glassy waves where where you get this peak of the wave, that line that runs in between these two surface orientations, it might not be so clear to see. There might be just a faint highlight there. That's what I drew that line here on. So true drawing that's based on classical skills, not just on copying, um, is based on a lot of visual thinking, a lot of visual imagining. If this was made out of concrete, if this was made out of sand, where would I see the edge? 
the plane change. So let me start with the shape of the breaking lip here. So this segment is being overlapped by this, let's call it a cloud again. And then that's being overlapped by this bigger one right here. And then here, this curls over, right? Sometimes it's good to draw these kind of cross contour lines in just to remind you of what is happening form wise. You may not draw it like that later on, but like if you apply some shading, you might kind of follow that cross contour movement. And then it's kind of sprayed across with, with the droplets. But again, if you wanted to draw those droplets, that would cost you a couple of hours because it's a bunch of little droplets. Uh, unless you have a very smudgy charcoal and you can work an effect that looks like that. Okay, so let me think. Let's put in some values. And at this point, I'm ignoring, as I said earlier, I'm ignoring that kind of film-like white that's kind of stretched across the water surface. And if that's something that you're interested in, you wanted to put it in, you can always erase that back into your local value. And when I am putting the value onto the page, I don't know if you can tell, I'm even changing the direction of my marks. So for all the surfaces that are more upright, they get value applica application like this. As they're angling up more, they get a val value application like that, valuing up even more. So it's almost like a cross contour way of applying that value. Okay, so now as we get closer towards the front here and closer this way, things get darker. Here you can see the plane change is really nice at the very end of the wave.
again, in terms of value, rule of thumb is anything that is whitewash, white water, even the shadow part on those areas should be lighter than any of the blue parts of the water. So I'm implying the texture of the spray water at the edge of its shape. So if you were here for the last few sketch sessions, we talked a lot about texture and where to place it so we don't lose the structure when we're talking about foxes. Same idea. You create a little shorthand that feels like water splashes to you and you place that shorthand on the edges of your whitewash shapes. And if you're not quite sure how to create your shorthand, like I'm not super satisfied with my shorthand right now. So to remedy that, so one choice would be like to beat yourself up like, oh, this looks shitty. Um, a better choice would be to then do a study, get close up on one of those torn white water edges, draw them in an enlarged way and notice what they're like. Like, are they little hooks or like how do the drops work and once you feel like you understand it then you can reduce it into like this shorthand indication Again, texture, always place it at the edges, whether it's the edge of a shape or the um, like a plane change edge or a shadow edge. So here I'm adding now this darker accent for that dark, dark, dark water. And you see like right in here we have a reflection um, we have like some some light coming through the wave creating a little reflection here and the trick with reflections is to not get them super bright um, because they still need to group into the value of, of the water like if they make them if you make them too bright they'll get visually confused with the whitewash So I don't know, my timer crapped out on me. I'm just gonna keep drawing a little bit more on this and then I'll move to the last image of the evening.
Okay. All right, so let me switch to the last image, which is very different. So this one is much more close up and we'll get a great opportunity to study some of these smaller facets and um, plane changes. Have I said that word enough today? Let's see, give me just a second. I need to click around here. <laughs> oh, hold on. Okay, this time I'm making sure that I'm setting the timer. 15 minutes. Let's hope it works. All righty. You know, let me switch pencils. Here. So even in a situation like this, do we have a gesture? Because a gesture is the visual connection of the disparate parts. And we usually think that we need to draw all hectically during the gesture phase, and it's better if you don't. <laughs> it's better to just draw deliberately, rhythmically. Again, because your goal is to connect the parts, and you can't do that all hectically. You gotta like, zoom out and see where does this reach out to? Where is this coming from? So again, at the end, you can, or if you have to hop off early, just put in the chat any of the numbers of the images you'd love to see resolved. Just put one, two, three, or four. This is number four. Now that I have my gesture, I work on the shapes. And I wanted to pick this picture towards the end because it's so calm and it reminds me of being in the water and that really calm feeling you can have if you like water and it, you know, and it's one of your happy places. Like for me, being in the water towards the end of the day, like there's something really magical about that. So this makes me think about that. So at this part of the drawing, I'm kind of simultaneously working on better shapes and starting to build some form. Again, by kind of thinking about the facets. And it is tricky. I mean, this is not an easy lesson because it's such a fluid subject matter. And so there are no hard edges for us to observe, you know? It's not like we have a bunch of cardboard boxes in front of us, like we did when we did our present, like when we, for Christmas time, when we drew the presents, the boxes, right? Like there was really clear cut where the edges are of those boxes. But here, these are all like rounded and they're being kind of rippled. And so, you know, we just, we do our best. We do our best and sometimes it works out and we get to celebrate and other times it just, you know, doesn't come together. But just because it doesn't come together every single time doesn't mean 
uh, you're not a real artist. It doesn't mean you're not a good artist. It just means that that drawing didn't work out. And rather than spending time in the uh, the sucked part of the brain, um, switch over and think, okay, well, let me see if I can figure out why it didn't work out. Does it have to do with my shapes? Does it have to do with my values? Does it have to do with how I put the values on the paper? And sometimes we get answers to these questions and sometimes we don't. And if, <laughs> if we don't get answers, that doesn't mean like all hope is lost. It just means today you didn't get an answer. Next time, maybe you'll come at it from a different angle. Maybe you get an answer then. And of course we can kind of expedite the learning curve by looking at master artists, you know, and find, okay, how did this artist deal with the subject matter? And then you do a side-by-side -side comparison, your drawing, their drawing. And, and again, rather than like beating yourself up for not being a Da Vinci, you just like try and stay on point. Um, how are, how are his shapes? How are your shapes? How are his values? How are your values? I'm just having a really good time kind of following these very abstract patterns. And however long you stay in this kind of preparatory structural part of the drawing, that's your choice. If you want to get to a resolution, you pick an area and you start to get more detailed in that area. But again, with just 15 minutes, it might be just one tiny little corner. So I'm focusing on this kind of little ripple right in the middle. And what I'm doing is I'm looking at where do I see the shapes where the light is hitting. Almost like a little teardrop type shape. And where's the dark? And again, so I have my reference kind of in front of me on, on, a, on a bigger screen. Um, but since this is a very small detail, what I kind of want to do is just like stick my nose really close to it so I can really see what kind of shape this is. And sometimes when it's too far away, it's hard for, to do so. So if you want me to finish this one out and post it on Instagram, I pull it onto a screen that's much closer to me. I'd blow it really big on the screen and then draw very, very slowly to capture these very small shapes. So right now, because I am further away, I'm just kind of trying to get a sense of what these shapes are like, kind of mimic them a little bit, but they're not 100% those shapes.
So here, that's a facet that's angling this way, not getting so much light. This one is the brightest one here on the left side. At the, the structure of a wave is pretty much the same whether you're dealing with a tiny little ripple or a big one. So again, kind of notice how I'm angling my pencil depending on the angle of the water facet, the orientation of it. So it kind of scoops down like this, then this gets quite a bit of light and then it scoops down that way again. So another way to think about it is like, what's the topography of it? Like if you had to walk over this, how would that work out? We have one minute left. So right now I'm looking for the darker facets. Again, uh, that'll add just some accents. I'm trying to make them act, the accents look kind of characteristic. 
those kind of stretched, thin, watery shapes. I'm not being 100% accurate because, again, the time restraints. All right. <laughs> Let me turn this off. All right, well, let me switch over and kind of tell you um, what my thought process was towards the end. Also, um, of any of the drawings that we did tonight, if you are curious how I would be resolving one of them, um, let me know in the chat. Uh, I might still keep working on one of them uh, throughout the evening and then post the resolved picture on Instagram, either tonight or tomorrow. And um, like that you can see, oh, so this is how she finished it later on. Because again, these are just mid-process pictures. So um, thanks for the challenge. Chris, this was really, really good. It was really useful for me. I hope it was useful for you guys too. It wasn't easy, um, but it it is to me surprising that something so um, fluid and different from, from what we usually draw can still be navigated by um, applying the, the, the regular steps. Like it's not, it doesn't need to be treated any differently. Sure, later, if you want to imply the textures a little bit better, there might be certain charcoal techniques where you kind of erase stuff or um, that, that get that, that look that you want. But um, in terms of structure and in terms of lighting, uh, we can um, tackle it quite well with just how we've been going about our drawings, whether it's a fox or a person or a portrait. So um, let me run you through the, the pointers one more time. Strip away any of the narratives that you have attached to something scary that you're drawing, to something new that you're drawing, and come back to the process. Find the gesture, get the shapes, turn those shapes into forms by finding the plane changes or by finding some wrapping lines. And then when you have extra time, you add on top of that with values and later some textures. Find something that's similar to the thing that you're drawing. What is it like? What's the metaphor? So for waves, we used sand dunes, glassy sand dunes, right? And then it's, it pays to study the anatomy, not because knowing the words will help you out, but because knowing the parts will help you account for the elements that should be in your drawing. Once you have that, um, you can start implying see-through effects or reflective reflect effects by placing light shapes next to dark shapes. And you want to make sure that those light dark shapes are like when you kind of squint and zoom out that they feel like they belong to the same group, that they don't start to compete with the light shapes of the white water. Yeah, because anything that is the actual water is going to be darker than any of the kind of foamy parts, the more cloudy parts. And then again, the texture, that, that the ripples, the, the, the spray, any of that is being kept until the very end. So that, that's all I got for you. Um, I hope this was useful. I hope you sweat it as profusely as I did. And if you want to share any of your drawings, I'd love to give you a virtual high five over on Instagram. Tag me at Kira Studios. I know you worked hard and I want to kind of tell you that you did a good job. Even if the drawings didn't turn out great, I want to acknowledge your hard work. Um, if you like this and you want to catch more of these and you're not yet on my insiders email list, get on the insiders email list in the video below are several links that will send you that way. You can opt into the email list through a workbook that will improve your drawings with three simple questions, or you can opt in by um, getting a pen and ink um, tool guide, or you can opt in for my four day free figure drawing lowdown course where you're going to 
get the, the lay of the land, what figure drawing is all about and why it's so important, how to go about it the right way, etc. So I'd love to have you on my insiders list and tell you fun stories over there and keep you motivated to draw more and um, just, you know, keep, keep up your creativity. Alrighty, next week we'll be back to figure drawing and um, I'm not quite sure yet what the what the focus will be, but you'll find out if you're on the insiders list or over on Instagram eventually too. Alrighty, have a good evening and I'll see you next time. Take care.